Absolutely perfect. Well, look, looking forward to today. Um, thank you for coming along. My name is Matthew Baird. To anyone who who is watching this back or that I've not met before, I've been doing social housing recruitment now for eleven years, nearly, um, and set up on my own over a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago now, just doing social housing recruitment across the UK. These forums were created um, for everybody to come online, have a conversation together, and try and install real change. Um, and that's what I'm hoping we can do. And through that, I was, I think Rosie reached out. I think you reached out to me with this one, actually, Rosie, in terms of saying, seeing the roundtables, you know, looks like an interesting thing. And you've just finished this amazing pilot project. So please kind of introduce yourself to the table today. Um, and I guess why you brought the topic to the table in the first place. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. And listen, thank you so much to everybody who's joining or anybody who's watching this later. Um, it's a really important topic and it's just really nice to have people involved. And thank you for, you know, committing your time to this. So my name is Rosie May Iredale and my most recent role was coordinating the Bristol part of a national pilot called the Staying Close Project. And today I'm going to be talking about what that project is what we did um, and the other cohorts did and what the future of that project looks like because actually that's going to be rolled out on a larger scale and my most recent role so was essentially project managing coming up with new innovation and new ways to support care leavers and really focusing on what Bristol needs um, so all the cohorts really focused on the specific needs of each area geographically my background is that I have worked in residential children's homes for quite a long time. I actually trained as a primary school teacher, believe it or not, uh, which led me kind of quite organically into, into working with, with young people more around um, the residential setting. I was really passionate about it. And um, I worked my way up from residential child care worker to managing a children's home and then was really fortunate to get this job but so you know really really enjoyed it really exciting and my goal for the next step for me is to look at how I can support people in general not just care leavers but I'm looking to see how I can support around the topic of housing and also build on the work that we've done the staying close project and help other authorities to be able to innovate around the way they support the young people and so when the you know when, when how did that kind of first um you know how, how did it start where did it come from and i guess how, how did you get it off the ground because it's a really interesting story the, the staying close project is that yeah yeah absolutely yes yeah so the staying close project came off the back of the um staying put project which that was launched in, I think, 2014. And that was really about supporting young people who are in foster care to be able to stay put in their foster placements for longer. So actually what was found was that almost half of those people, young people were choosing to stay with their foster carers and actually half of them did. And those young people were twice as likely to be in employment, education or training. So the outcomes for them were really good. So the Department for Education, who, um, you know, this was their, their kind of thing, they thought, well, we're doing this for young people from foster care. What about young people from residential children's homes? And that's where this all came from. It started in 2017 with a, a range of authorities putting in an expression of interest. We were one of those authorities who was successful. And we were basically given a pot of money and said, <laughs> go and do something with this um you know innovate try new things make mistakes come back feedback co open conversation let's talk about it and let's see you know what things we can come up with that can then be rolled out nationally and that was always the goal and so from there it's kind of developed into this this kind of long-term project that obviously had a number of its own stumbling blocks and things along those lines. But I guess for you, what where it got started, you, you kind of got involved with with finding out where the big issues were. What were the key stumbling blocks, I guess, when starting this project off? Wow, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there were many, uh, many stumbling blocks. I mean, one of the issues was around 
identifying who the cohort would be because there are is a huge number of young people who have been in care at some point and there was you know discussions on who should be able to access this what age range are we going to go for are we going to scoop up the young people who left care three four five years ago or is it just going to be the new ones um the other sort of the main thing was identifying what are the main issues what are the best ways we can help our young people and support them um we did quite a big piece of work having young people steering groups and finding out from them what they wanted and what they needed and um you know they were actually the main people that kind of came up with the ideas you know I, I can't take credit for a lot of these ideas they, it was our young people we just needed to find out how we could help them um and I'd say the biggest challenge for us was around housing you know we did a bit of kind of preliminary work finding out what the biggest uh hurdles were for our young people and we found that housing was number one kind of top of the list issue and if a young person wasn't in the right housing everything else fell apart as soon as we got young people into the right housing that was when we really started to see those other outcomes really improve and then those softer outcomes like you know mental well-being health um, feeling less isolated and lonely feeling more connected you know having more of a social life more of a connection with their family all that stuff fell into place you know we looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs we needed to address shelter and we needed young people to have food on a table and you know finances as well um, was a big one. And I know housing was one of those areas which it's changed, isn't it? Like when we go, oh, we've got housing providers, we've got local authorities, this should be an easy kind of fix. And yet actually, from all the work I've been doing in supported exempt accommodation for a fair while now, that that partnership working has been almost the biggest struggle. Mm. Um, but you had some real successes with it, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, I would say that was the areas, one of the areas we had the most success. I mean, Bristol is... Um, you know, each author, each area was very different and each area had its own challenges, but housing was kind of a, uh, across the board. But Bristol in particular, we don't have a lot of social housing compared to the number of care leavers who want that housing. And they don't want to live with other people. They want to live independently, but they are sticking in high support accommodation. It's very expensive, but also not very appropriate for some of these vulnerable young people when they're placed with other vulnerable young people and they weren't they were kind of stuck in that system because there wasn't somewhere for them to move to and the other issue that we had was around the geographical location so young people going through the same bidding system as everybody else and you know they've got to accept a property at some point otherwise they'll lose their place but they're being offered properties that are the other side of the city from their children's home, their family, their friends, their college, um, their work. And that was proven to be a really, really big problem for our young people. But what we realized is, you know, these young people, they're always going to have a priority to get a social housing place. That's always going to happen. There's never going to be a time where we say you can't have a house. But joining up the two dots of from social services aspect and housing, why aren't we just putting those young people into the right property in the first place? First of all, when they're ready, so training them for independence. Second of all, with a support network around them, so a member of staff that goes with them, that supports them to move into that, that property and to maintain the property, but also in the right place so it's close enough to everything that they have already established um so one of the key pieces of work that we did was a relationship um partnership working both between social services and housing within the council to place young people directly into the right property but we also expanded on that and we built a relationship with some housing associations that provided accommodation as well so that young people could have a housing association property when they were ready and one of the things that 
we got as feedback from housing associations that we spoke to was that they had felt that a lot of their young people who come from care, who were living in their properties, those tenancies had broken down, they were unsuccessful for a range of issues. And quite a high proportion of them was down to rent arrears. Some of it was sort of antisocial behavior. Some of it was that young people weren't staying there often enough. Um, and by having the support network through their staying close worker, so a member of staff that came to support them with up to 10 hours a week of support, and the fact that we were training young people for independence and we were not putting them forward for a direct offer of housing until we knew that they were ready to live on their own, we completely turned that around. So every young person that we gave a direct offer to had a completely successful tenancy and that completely shifted the relationship. So after that, we had more housing associations that were kind of willing to come on board because of the success stories. And another aspect of that as well was that we always made sure that we set up so that rent would come directly to the landlord, whoever that was. So the issue of rent arrears was completely eradicated as well. So that was a really positive piece of work that didn't cost an awful lot for us to deliver, but had a really, really high impact as well on, you know, both housing associations saving time and money, you know, chasing up tenancies that aren't working very well, but also for our young people and for the local authority, it was a really successful piece of work. Let's talk a little bit about those costs. If anybody does have questions, by the way, at any time, please use the hand raise function at the at the bottom of the screen um, and, and come in at any point. You know, we want this to be as open as you can or, or put messages in the chat. Again, absolutely fine. But you mentioned there that everything is high impact, low cost, which is, you know, and if we're ever looking for an answer for social housing, that's the, those the, you know, the, the partnerships that we're looking for across the board there. Um, I'll bring in just a sec, Nigel, but with, with the cost side of things, Mm. how was it then justified kind of within that like you say, it was low cost so what what were those costs do you feel that that kind of came through and what because i'm trying to work out why this hasn't been i guess replicated across the rest of the country well really the the cost is time it's it's additional staffing capacity and time the the one cost that we did have was we would pay young people's deposits um, so that was a, a cost that was absorbed through staying close funding. Um, and we also, you know, supported with some kind of moving costs and bits of furniture and, you know, helping them get set up. Um, but as you know, young people, are, well, you may not know, but young people actually do have access to a fund. Every young person when they move in from care also has access to a fund for that sort of thing. Um, but the main cost was really uh, extra capacity. So we'd have somebody who would like their staying close worker that would do the work on our side to open up that conversation with the housing association, have a look at where they should be, um, you know, kind of provide a, a bit of a snapshot to them so that they could look for the right property. And then there's just somebody in the housing association who's putting a bit of extra time to find the right placement, um, look at things like who are the neighbors, you know, is this a vulnerable young person? Do we know that there's somebody down the street who has X behavior? Would that be detrimental to them? There's kind of a little bit of extra time and thinking, but, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. You know, a, a little bit of extra time at the beginning is saving a lot of time for everybody later on when those tendencies are successful and we're not dealing with issues like young people becoming homeless and, you know, if to, you ever look at the cost associated with how much it costs for a table fa failed tenancy, then you're right, it, it really does add up. Nigel, let me bring you in. Uh, yes, thank you, Rosie. That was great. One thing that struck me straight away was this 10 hours of support you were offering your clients per week, which is uh, fantastic as a pilot project. Uh, two questions related to that. How many of your clients, your young people, took that offer up? Uh, and secondly, how obviously this was a pilot project um, with a with a I don't know the specifics of the group. How could that be translated nationally as you know as an ideal 
because I think that's a key element, offering that kind of dedicated, bespoke um, kind of resource is, is really important, but how could it be extended nationally to, to LAs or other people? Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. That's a really brilliant question. So I'll answer that in two parts, your two questions. So first of all, you asked about how many young people actually access that. Now, what we found was that when young people were first moving on from care, a lot of them were accessing quite a high amount of support. As they got settled, that support would reduce. And then if they'd have crises in their life, sometimes that support would increase again. So it was really, really flexible. And, you know, a lot of our young people didn't need 10 hours. They were accessing three, four hours a week. Some of them did need 10 hours. And in fact, some of them had a little bit more when they needed it, especially if things had happened in their life. Um, now, of course, it was a pilot and we had, you know, the amount of funding that we had was probably not representative of what a national rollout will look like. But the staying close offer, what was discovered through the pilots is that each area needs to have a personalized staying close offer. So we don't know exactly what that national rollout will look like. We're in phase two, another, I think eight authorities have joined the pilot. So there's another eight authorities who've got some funding now and they're gonna do similar things based on what the first cohort did and at the end of that there will be a decision on what that national rollout will look like but from having a conversation with the DfE what we think it will look like is each local authority will have a pot of money and that will be probably possibly based around how many young people they have um, you know staying put is based on how many young people they've had over the last three years there's been a bit of criticism of that so it might look a little bit different um but there will remain there will be some things that will remain the same across every local authority which is the core offer and the core offer is somebody to support you and somewhere to live um and then there's some there's some other stuff around that so some of the other cohorts did some other really interesting things I can go on to talk about if people would like to hear about that but um there's a lot of work around well-being you know access to food um independence training training for staff things like that but the core offer again for every local authority will be to somebody and somewhere Really interesting. There was a, just before I bring Kate in, there was a quick question in the chat, which was, do we know which local authorities have the funding? Yes, I thought you were going to ask me that. So let me tell you. The new cohort, so the phase two cohort is Wiltshire, Wakefield, Sheffield, Newcastle upon Tyne, Tameside, Manchester, Stockport, Gateshead, Hull City, Somerset, Southampton, South Tyneside, Dorset, Coventry, and Durham. So an awful lot in the north, uh, certainly the northeast, particularly there. Then actually, judging by the, the numbers kind of coming through. And then the cohorts that were in phase one, I'll just get them up for you. There's not quite as many of them. Let me just grab them for you. Exciting times though for the northeast, and, and also for Coventry. I think that'd be really interesting. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, a couple of charities. So Brake was one of the charities. Um, Bristol Council, St Christopher's was another charity. Um, Suffolk Fairways, another charity. North East Lincolnshire, Portsmouth, North Tyneside. And yeah, that, so that was the phase one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it should be really interesting to see certainly what happens kind of through the next, through the next phase. When does the phase start, do you know? Or has it already? Yes, it's already started for the phase two, um, and that is going right through up until 2024, I believe. And at that point, as I say, there will be a national rollout. So they'll be really interesting to see what comes back from phase two. There isn't so many kind of new things happening in the phase two. It's more about those cohorts looking at what the first cohort did and saying, what would work for us? Let's kind of you know, pick and mix, pick and choose what we think is going to be more appropriate. And actually the funding is is less than the first cohort as 
you know, to kind of, you know, that mirrors that the fact that you know, they're do things. yeah, they're kind of picking up on, on what we've we've done. Kate, thank you for being so patient. Please do come in. No, no, thank you. I've got so many questions, Rosie. Um, first of all, apologies. Um, I'm working from home, so you can either have voice or face, but you can't have both, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so I used to run um, youth housing in Lincolnshire, 16 to 25. So my first question is, is did you do sort of like a halfway house? We used foyers and we used funding to sort of get them tenancy ready. Um, and the second question that I have, that is not just across care leavers, really, but from any sort of supported accommodation um, into a housing association is how did you manage that sort of transfer of information? I worked worked in supported exempt for too many years now. And the things that we always hear from housing associations is, is it's only at the point of crisis when the tenancy fails that somebody will say, well, I had an early help worker, I had a social worker, I had a drugs worker, I had, you know, a worker for my dog, whatever it might be. Um, and it's only at that point that it's all too late. So um, so I'd be really interested to sort of see how you managed it. Did you take them straight from care at 18 when everything falls off? Or did you sort of, sort of do it as a phased sort of um, uh, input into housing associations? That's a really great question. Thank you, Kate. Um, again, I'll answer that in two parts. So I'll, I'll talk about your first part. Um, you asked about kind of halfway house um, preparation for independence. So we did a few different things. Um, some of the local authorities actually commissioned their own support housing. So they rented a building, staffed it, um, had that as a kind of an intermediary between the children's home and moving on. Um, one of the things that we did in Bristol, which was really, really innovative and interesting. Um, so we asked our young people, you know, how could we support you better for your transition from leaving care? And they actually said to us, um, we would like to live in the garden of our children's home. So that's what we did. We put a pot house. We worked with a really great company called Agile Homes and we installed a fit for purpose, um, one bedroom, eco-friendly pot house into one of the gardens. And while the young person was living in there, they had intensive independence training, but they also had support of staff on site so we found that to be a really successful model. Um, that was kind of the perfect transition to then feed on to the next phase, which could look like support housing. It could look like living independently. Um, we had a couple of young people that did go straight from children's homes to independent properties, housing association or council houses. Um, and the reason that we were able to do that was because in the homes, staff were delivering our ASDAN independent living course. So we were confident that those young people were ready to live independently. Now, not all young people are ready for that. So we did have some that did come from support accommodation and there was a lot of challenges around that. And, you know, we put a lot of extra things in place for those young people. So that might look like, help to get to college, uh, money for work clothes, help getting their lunch, you know, any extra support we could do to maintain education work placements were really, really important. Um, and again, those staying close workers were delivering that independent skills course. So the ASDAN course covers a whole range of topics and we were asking young people to have completed a certain number of units before we'd actually put them forward for independent living. That was the condition that they needed to complete this work so that we could then go to the housing association and actually evidence that that young person knows how to manage a tenancy. They know how to keep the house tidy. They know how to budget, you know, all of those really key and important things. Um, the second part, you talked about the transfer of information to support accommodation. Now, from support accommodation. Now, I, I completely agree with you um, on what you're saying, Kate, and this was one of the areas where having that staying close worker was so fundamental. So the staying close worker, in the majority of cases, um, it's just worth noting that we were very flexible. It was always the member of staff that was best suited to work with that young person, the person they trusted the most, didn't have to be from their children's home. Um, but the person that would support them 
with someone that has known them for a long period of time, not someone who's just met them. It's not a new member of staff. It's someone they have an established relationship with who knows their case, who knows everything about them, who knows everybody who's working around them and knows their strengths and areas for concern. So when we were approaching housing associations, we would say, this is our young person. Let We'll tell you about them. This is the areas that they have developed independence in. These are the things that are the challenges. And these are the people that are working with that young person. So that was fundamental in ensuring that, you know, that housing associations were aware of the full picture. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and just one final question. Like I said, I could, I could sit and talk to you for hours. <laughs> but um, but my, my other one was around... Um, Specifically, specifically if they go into supported or semi-supported accommodation and they have an apprenticeship or they're working as we know care leavers in many councils are guaranteed an apprenticeship um, and how uh, did you find that there were any issues about um, rent issues and stuff like that that was one of the issues that we found is that if they were working or if they were in an apprenticeship suddenly supported accommodation although they needed the support became very expensive for them um, and it was one of the things that we struggled with constantly so while that they had the need to be in education training or work actually they're being penalized even as a care leaver yeah so thank you for that Kate do you know what that is one of the biggest bugbears actually um, and we had this happen to some of our young people and in answer to your question um, no young people in apprenticeships cannot afford to live in a housing association, association property yeah. it is it's completely you know it's ridiculous that our young people cannot afford to, to do apprenticeships. Um, so we actually introduced, and this is one of the things that we did in Bristol, and it's probably, it was my baby. I'm very proud of it. I'm really, you know, I would love to expand on this and be able to deliver this on a wider scale, is that we developed a pre-apprenticeship program. Mm. Because what we found was many of our young people who come from children's homes are not ready to commit to the number of hours required for an apprenticeship. And also those young people often don't know what they want to do and struggle to commit to any kind of work schedule because actually a lot of them have been out of education for quite a while. So we introduced a pre-apprenticeship and we used some of our funding to help young people to do work experience, any sector they want, any job, we'd help them find a business or you know a section of the local authority that would take them on and we would pay them and we'd pay them a good wage to do that not an apprenticeship wage a decent wage to do that um and that was a really transformative piece of work because it allowed young people to try different sectors to make mistakes you know, I don't know about you, but I had a million jobs when I was 17, 18, 19. And yes, I probably got sacked from a couple of them and I messed a couple of them up. But I had the safety of home. I could make mm. that mistake and I could go back and say, oh, this didn't go very well. But, you know, I'm not going to not be able to feed myself. I'm not going to, you know, get kicked out of my house because I can't pay my rent. So that's why we did our pre-apprenticeship offer to kind of tackle that as one of the issues. And if a young person wanted to do an apprenticeship, they could do it through the pre-apprenticeship program instead um obviously there were costs associated with that but i mean the costs weren't a lot we were you know it's an hourly wage for a young person it's not a huge amount of money these young people weren't doing full weeks they were kind of dipping their toes in um and because so they were on top of the hourly wage rather than just kind of giving them a lump sum of money yeah yeah i mean well the young people weren't doing enough hours for, actually, for it to impact their benefits and we were really, you know, adamant about them not doing it, not doing that, because we don't want young people to, um, you know, fall out of that work, not get paid that month, and then have the huge issue where they not got the benefits for that month. And as we all know, Universal Credit has a six week delay, yeah. so, you know, completely inappropriate for young people um, from care who have no backup, no support network. Um, to be not having any money for six weeks so yeah thank you for that question kate really good nice thank you yeah i think i'll definitely that uh, yeah i can see you two definitely connecting afterwards and following up on that but before yes, i jump please. to mercy's um mercy had a question before i jump on that i'm going to bring alison in hi 
apologies, I joined a little bit late, so if you've already covered this, but I was interested in what you were saying about um, the roles of, of the housing officers and housing associations, about that real first-hand knowledge about communities and the neighbours and everything. And I just wondered how we squared that with the sort of choice-based lettings in some areas and, and whether you do supported bids and then suss the property out or are they done as direct lets? It's a bit of a technical allocation point. I was just interested in how it worked in practice. Yes, so um, young people would still be set up on the same system as they would be if they were bidding and young people could still bid. But the, the system, I mean, I can go into this, you know, in, in more detail, um, but essentially the system was there would be a, a designated contact in the housing association and the staff member who's helping that young person would contact the housing associations directly and see if they had a property in the right area. So there's, quite, you know, a little bit of conversation going on there um, but at the meantime young people were still bidding and they'd yes they'd still be within that system so you know housing associations could also access all their information through that system as well did that cause issues if they were kind of applying on one side and on the other at all did you have any conflict there no no we, we didn't have any problems and actually there was even a young person that we offered them a direct offer and they mm. said no I've bid on a property and I want to have that one instead and it it didn't it didn't pose a problem but the, the nice part as well was that we could kind of preempt it as well so we could say you know they're going to be ready in a few months and a housing association might say well look we don't have a property available now but we have a property coming up this then and they could already kind of identify someone to go into that property or housing associations could say we've got a property coming up do you have anyone that would like it um so you know we could hold on to young people for a little bit longer um in the guys that they were going to the right property but yeah we didn't we did, didn't have any any kind of problems and um you know there was still that duty for young people by their personal advisor to be set up on the system as well so yeah i hope that answers your question thanks brilliant thank you there was a, a question there from uh like I said from mercy in the chat which is why do you think there is so much, I guess, uptake for this in the northeast? Was this due to accessibility to wraparound services or was it a result of kind of structural factors? Do you know? No, I couldn't comment on that, I'm afraid. Um, you know, every every authority is different um, and has their own challenges. You know, geographical areas have their own challenges. I mean, particularly in the southwest, the issues, well, in the whole of the south of England, the issues were around um, not having enough access to housing um but i couldn't i couldn't tell you why there's been more success uh in the north couldn't, couldn't answer that i think they've clearly gone for areas of you know where there is a, where there is a great need and i think at the moment there is, there is a great need in the northeast as there is across the country but you know it is it is certainly an area that you know I've, I've, i'm recruiting a, a registered manager up there at the moment and there is, there is a big demand for any kind of support support services at all richard thank you for coming with us today do please come in no worries, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Rosie. And also, I find it strange there's not um, a trial area in London because normally there's always mm. a trial area in London, um, which is where we got <laughs> where we got a bundle of our stock. Um, Rosie, again, apologies if you, you covered it because I missed the start. Um, we've got a foyer in Wiltshire, so that's why I'm I'm really intrigued. Who who's the contact? Not obviously for individual contact, but sort of you know it, where where is this money going into, and who who are we best trying to contact to then talk to them about? about them having the second phase of funding. Yeah, absolutely. So the contact is, it will be somebody in children's services. So it's okay. children's services that are kind of overseeing this, that are dealing with the funding. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I am looking at how I can support people to build on this work. So there might be a piece of work I might be able to support you in some way in, you know, creating that contact and seeing how that partnership working can go. Because I think sure. the, the main the main kind of bit of learning and experience that we got was really around that partnership working and that being key, absolutely fundamentally key um, yeah. to the success of, of the project. Lovely. Thank you. My big thing with the social housing and certainly with doing these roundtables and other sides really is to try and grow trust amongst the housing sector because there is still an awful lot of distrust amongst each other. It was evidently wasn't a short project. It was something that 
evidently took an awful lot of it, uh, and the hours put in, let's be fair, weren't shy. <laughs> We've talked about that before as well. How, from beginning kind of to end, did you find hostility at the beginning or kind of a lot of pushback and how did you overcome that? Very interesting question, Matt. Um, <laughs> to go down that with these. It's I think questions, but it's one of those. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is the project wasn't just about housing. So we were dealing with people in lots of different sections of the local authority and also dealing with a lot of outside organisations as well. Um, I think, you know, there were definitely challenges in particular from housing uh, and housing associations because there was a kind of a thought of you know you know this isn't a criticism but people do have negative views of young people in care and care leavers and there are big challenges in working with this cohort and the outcomes for a lot of these young people are unfortunately still very much behind their peers who were not in care and a lot of that was really about building that trust through the staying close workers. So that fantastic relationship that young people have with their staying close workers, if you don't know much about children's homes, I can tell you that for some of these young people, they are like their family members. And I have young people that I worked with that I'm still in touch with five, six years later. And, you know, I really do see them as very important in my life and they certainly that's reciprocated and when young people are they don't have trust so it's a two-way street right yeah, but and there's clearly people, a stigma there isn't there there's a stigma but these young people don't trust the system because they were thrown into a system often they were never asked to be thrown into and when they're dealing with new members of staff new organizations new situations that is really, really challenging for some of them. And when they came along with their staying close worker, they felt safe, you know, they felt supported and that completely transformed that. So we were able to build that trust through showing that actually these things can be successful if they are done in the right way and really centered around that specific young person and kind of have an understanding of them. Um, we had a lot of challenges with housing and that's just down to housing stock. So, you know, we had to kind of go back and forth for a while and, and, and agree on numbers. So we had to do a bit of work and say to them, you know, because at first people were saying, you know, is it going to be hundreds of young people every year? And actually the numbers were a lot smaller than expected. And that being because, you know, the, the, the way young people come out is, is slower. We're trying to slow that down. You know, we're trying to keep them in the children's homes for longer. Um, so a lot of it was really about managing those expectations. You know, it's, we're not asking this much of you. We're asking this much of you. And we would come to people with an offer. We weren't just asking. We were offering something. We were saying, we have this funding. We have this staff members. We have this. We are offering something back. And there's a benefit to you if you offer this. It's actually going to save you time, save you money. Um, so there was a lot of relationship building at mm. the beginning and, you know, tackling that stigma as well. It's really, really interesting. There's a few things come to my mind, but I'm going to bring Nigel in before I, uh, before I ever said all the questions myself. Nigel, over to you. No, go ahead, Matthew. Oh, I no, please, please, please. <laughs> I can wait. I really like, Rosie, what you said about... Um, Getting, getting your young people involved, cooperating with them. I think there's a buzzword now called co-production, mm. whatever that means. <laughs> but did you learn, so going back to what you learned, did you learn anything from that particular process that you hadn't anticipated? I like the, something you said about getting housing in gardens or something. Mm. What had you, basically, what did you learn that you hadn't anticipated in the pilot project? That is an absolute brilliant question. And yes, uh, if you look at the Staying Close documents, we have used the word co-production. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, in Bristol, we ran a young people steering group. So once a month, we invited um, all of our care leavers, anybody you could join, no matter how long ago that they left care. It wasn't just our, our cohort that we were supporting. 
um and we invited them once a month we'd go and have ice cream and you know do nice things have pizza and um meet up at city hall in the very nice building and we would um ask them you know for their feedback and it was really really interesting because you know the things that we thought were important were not the things that they thought were important um and you know we kind of came in going we need young people to get jobs and we need them to get into education and we need them to you know we were looking at all the hard outcomes but actually the feedback from young people was we want help to feel less scared about moving on we we're lonely we're isolated we don't have people we don't have networks you know mental health was a big thing you know we feel low um the big thing was we thought we were ready to move on and actually we weren't and you know I don't know about you guys but when I moved out I still had a not now but I still had a bedroom to go back to if I realized that I wasn't quite ready these young people don't they don't have a step backwards um so the thing that they thought was the most important was that continued relationship from that staff member and actually being able to have that for as long as possible so we offered that up till age 25 actually and we said wow. look up until age 25 and I don't know what the national rollout will look like. I, I would be surprised if funding is going to stretch to that age. Um, but, you know, what we realized is that they wanted the, they wanted to be able to go and come back. You know, we don't always need you. We don't want you ringing us up every day. We don't want you hassling us, but we want you to be there when you need us. Um, and we also realized that office hours, that was really tricky, managing the fact that a staff member works certain hours, so, you know, we did offer young, some young people to be able to make contact with their children's homes if they had an issue because, you know, they're staffed 24 seven. They've got an issue out of their staying close workers working times will actually give the give the home a call. They wanted to feel like they still had somebody. Um, and the other thing that we didn't anticipate, which really hit really hard, was that young people said, I don't get any cards on my birthday I don't get any presents at Christmas and that was devastating for me so one of the other things we did was staying close workers would have a small budget to buy their young person a birthday present send them a card signed by all the staff from the home that they that you know that they that they knew um and also you send them something at Christmas as well and we also had um people donate things and we linked up with charities who donated gifts and we would distribute them to the young people at Christmas and we had a Christmas meal. Um, so what we realized was that, and actually there's a lot of organizations out there that help young people get work, education, training, blah, 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 if they engage with it. What they wanted was a continuation of that relationship and the fact that we are a corporate parent in inverted commas, but you know we are their family in some cases. The relation with Bradby, the word I was going to use was family. I think it's very easy sometimes to forget that a lot, you know, troubled families are, I think anybody doesn't realise that as a safety net. It's, it's exactly that. And when you were saying before, actually, that I, that I really liked was when you said that when you were first going along, you know, these aren't, you know, you, you knew some of your young people for six, seven years before you transitioned through. Yeah. And it was like you were that kind of almost guardian for that person and, and going through. I guess, how has it been, you know, over that course of the time and people actually moving on? You mentioned there that some people then went, actually, I don't need you anymore. I'm good, but I'll come to you when I need you. How was that from a staffing perspective of trying to kind of, you know, your side and the council kind of trying to let go, going, are they okay? Are they not? Because everything, that's a really powerful relationship to have with a young person who has gone through, evidently, you know, extensive trauma. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges actually was around staffing so you know it's a fluid um relationship between that young person and the staff member that staff member also has a responsibility they still work in the children's home the staying close workers are still needed in their role um so that was the area that needed the most um flexibility so the way that it worked in bristol now 
other authorities did it in different ways, but the way that we chose to do it was each home was allocated a budget for staying close hours and they could use that as they needed, basically. Um, you know, if anybody needs to talk about this in more detail, I'm happy to, um, you know, go into <laughs> exact detail about it. But um, that's essentially how it works to allow that flexibility. And staff members also, you know, offered a bit of flexibility as well. So they might say, look, I don't mind doing a couple of hours overtime to go see whoever after my shift or before my shift or you know, can we get a staff member from another home to come across to cover me so I can go and help, you know, somebody go to a job interview or, you know, a funeral or, you know, things that pop up that aren't always expected. Um, so we tried where possible to be as flexible as possible around that. Um, some of the other cohorts actually had designated workers who that was their full time job that they would go out and do the support. But but we found for us, it, it worked more effectively if we just allowed homes to have an extra capacity to deliver that work. And what, why do you think that is? Because I mean, from a obviously from a recruitment perspective on my side, but also staffing at the moment is, even if we go back four or five years, so much more difficult than it than it was. You know, I mean, there, there's no, no no point trying to hide from the fact that anything in housing, support, care, all of these areas are now massively understaffed and struggling to secure staff. And a lot of that is down to down to wages and things like that and people being poached etc and also burnout mm -hmm. so what why do you think kind of that more i guess flexible approach where i'm having someone dedicated work better for bristol um i mean the thing is is that if we employed people on a full-time basis to deliver staying close work we might end up wasting quite a lot of money because that staff member might end up sitting around not doing an awful lot one week and then the next week there might be an extra capacity needed and listen look I'm not saying that there is a perfect solution to this because it's going to vary day to day week to week month to month um, but having the flexibility allowed us to at least say well this home's got four young people they're supporting you've got six you've got one well you know that we need to kind of look at you're not going to need as much capacity as you are but maybe in a couple of months time that might be a, a different way around um obviously the fact that we were extending the relationship of the staff member from the children's home that was tricky because that that person is on a, is on shift in the children's home and you know like everywhere there are staffing shortages i mean <laughs> dare i even mention the word covid uh, because that would be something to talk about as well, how we worked through... Somebody had it on the bingo and we've got 10 to 12. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait for that question. Um, but, yeah, my job as a coordinator, I found a lot of that was around supporting children's homes managers to work out how they were going to deliver the individual needs at the time. And a lot of that was around... Um, you know, setting up the project in a way that when my job finished, that that could continue. So there was a lot of work around how can we make this sustainable? And that work now is done between the managers. It's an agreement. You know, how is that going to work? And as I say, it's always going to change. But we, we know we might need a bit of extra capacity around Christmas, for example, or when uh, the new college year is starting. We can kind of think ahead on some stuff, but a lot of it is really down to that partnership working, those relationships and those systems that are in place to, to assess that and manage that um, and try and try and save money where we can because we don't want to waste money on, on staff hours when a young person could benefit from them a week later or you know later down the line. If anyone has more questions, please, please dive in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting some sent kind of directly that I'm asking and then others that, like I said, please just ask away. But with those relationships between the homes then, I take it that was almost just as imperative for this service to run as anything else. Did they improve through doing this service, do you feel? Like the relationships between the different children's services themselves, was that, was that another positive outcome, I guess, that came from this? But, um, yeah, I mean... Our children's homes work very closely together anyway. Um, they're, all, they're always working together. But like I say, each authority is going to have different challenges. So, you know, the relationship between um, the private homes, that was more challenging to manage 
And we did um, also offer funding. We didn't just do it in our children's homes. We did also offer funding to some private children's homes to deliver that work. That involved a bit more of kind of back and forth and a bit more learning um and you know something that would be really beneficial in the future if other authorities are, are planning to do this would be some training around that i think for those private homes to understand how they deliver a staying close package because we were already very tied in with one another within the local authority and yet there were still challenges that came with that from a from the private side of things <laughs> absolutely i mean the core thing is we would give we would offer a young person a set number of hours per week. And that would initially look like a structured plan. We will see you on X, Y, Z day for this amount of time. If you miss it, fine, but we can't always change it. So that allowed us to be able to designate hours to homes, but then there was a great deal of being flexible and doing what we could. And I'm not saying we could always say yes to a young person, but we would do everything that we could to, to support them in the ways that they needed, working around the needs of the home. And that, you know, the needs of the home are also very important. And those young people, you know, they couldn't suffer as a result. Brilliant. Uh, Kate, I'm gonna bring you in and then we've got probably a final question from Nigel in the chat. So uh, yeah, Kate, please do. Um, it, it's sort of going back to your, your first point, actually, Rosie. So um, I used to deal quite a lot with young parents that had left care. So they'd already, already transitioned to another placement, yeah. but then had become pregnant, couldn't stay in that placement. Did you have any sort of funding to be able to manage then? Because certainly working in supported housing, that's um, another cohort within a cohort that we found to be really vulnerable. Um, and we got around that by pretty much doing a similar thing to your pod idea. We had six flats in um, a supported setting that were separate from the main um, building. But um, did, within Bristol or in any of the other local authorities, did you have any other schemes that sort of targeted that cohort particularly? Yes, thank you. That's a great question again. So um, we did identify that young parents was one of the cohorts that the, initially that we hadn't kind of considered enough um, and we identified that there was a really big need for you know two bed housing um, was just we really needed that um, so we did actually have a similar relationship where young people who were in one bed accommodation we were looking at um, direct offers for them um, to get into two bed accommodation as well um, and we also did some other things to, to support our young parents um, with young parents groups and some access to books and toys and things like that particularly in COVID we supported a lot of parents to get access to um, nappies and wet wipes and baby milk and things that they were struggling to get a hold of um, and you know we did have young people uh, that became pregnant whilst in the children's home and we did support them on their transition through to independent accommodation um, but certainly one of the more challenging challenging parts of that um, and that was really key around that that joined up working um, and also providing those young people that extra extra support time as well particularly around um, you know when baby was due or the lead up to when baby was due and you know going through all the assessments through social services that could be very traumatic for young people and you know we tried to support young people in the best way that they could to to be successful in being able to um keep their children so i hope that answers your question but yes certainly a challenge and it's something you know if you wanted to pick up on this later i would i'd be really happy to sit down and talk to you in in more more depth about Definitely, Rosie. I mean, I've, I've been working in Manchester recently and it's and it's a really big cohort that we have several care leavers who are massively vulnerable and not managing tenancies. They have children with their own issues and vulnerabilities, either hospital admissions, etc. Um, and it, it's it's actually a project that Manchester particularly, as most of the um, most of the local authorities, I think, could could really benefit from. Thank you, Kay. And I just wanted to note as well, a little side note from that. 
Um, we had a couple of young people that had children and wanted to move. We also had young people who didn't have children but that wanted to move, but across authorities. And this is something I just wanted to make sure I got in there. Um, and the, the reason it, it kind of spiked up in my brain was because we did have a couple of young people with children. They wanted to move to be closer to family, but their family lived in a different authority. And that was one of the issues where they couldn't access housing outside of their authority. So we also set up some inter-authority agreements where young people could have direct offers of housing in other authorities and there was a swap system in place. So right. we'll take some of yours, you take some of ours. And it wasn't always directly, I'll swap one Bristol for one Bath. It might be, I've got one in South Gloss who wants to go to Bath. I've got one in Bath who wants to go to Bristol, one in Bristol who wants to go to South Gloss. It could actually be a different arrangement. Um, but that was another one of the challenges for, for young people. They might have lived in a, a children's home in, an, in one area, but they want to be in X area because they actually have, um, you know, a granny who wants to help them with the baby or, you know, the some kind partner. of support network of some form anyway. Yeah, or the, yeah, or the partner um, that they had, they've had the baby with lives in X place, uh, you know. So it was really about opening up um, a, as much partnership working as possible to be able to support those young people with with children. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I can feel my accent slipping from speaking to you for too long, Rosie. So I'm just going to see what it's picked up. I'm originally from Plymouth. I spent 20 years down there, but it, it rarely slips that stand out after an hour of speaking to somebody with a broader accent. It's it's going. Um, as a last question, I mean, I know a couple of people have had to jump off, but um, look, Rosie, from me, a massive thank you. And, and I think it's been really, really insightful. So thank you so much for bringing, bringing this to the table. But uh, Nigel's asked that if there's one thing you could wish to change from this experience, what would that be apart from more money? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, partnership working, 100%, 100%. Um, you know, and I'm. this is one thing I'd like to do. And if, if this is something you're interested in, get in contact because I'll be offering this to, to people as a service, you know, supporting people to work in partnership between local authorities between children's services housing housing associations if we can do that joined up piece of work we can make a really really big difference and it doesn't cost a lot of money or a lot of time but it saves a lot of money and it saves a lot of time and it makes the biggest difference to our young people of everything that we did and do you think that changes just people being more open to it or do you think it's you know the the, the just knowing the intricacies of who of almost the languages of the different departments absolutely there are barriers different departments speak in different languages they work in different ways and you know having a system in place knowing how to do it knowing where the pitfalls are and having a designated person I mean that the key thing is is having someone who's willing to take some responsibility for that it doesn't have to be a whole new member of staff you don't need to create a new post but it's just allowing a capacity for somebody I couldn't, couldn't agree more and I think sometimes that taking ownership piece is well, I mean, it's everywhere in politics anyway, isn't it? So, um, Rosie, thank you so, so much. Thank you for everyone else who could come along today. I hope you were all able to get some excellent stuff taken away. This is a weekly roundtable. We do them every single Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Um, there is a, um, a link in Greek, so it's the Social Housing Roundtable, and you'll find it. They, we're running them every week till the 13th of December, um, along with a couple of specials as well. Next week, I've got Claire Foraker joining us to discuss whether or not mergers are having an effect on customer service. So again, could be an interesting one that actually probably ties in a little bit with this. Um, but Rosie, my biggest thank you to you. What's the easiest way for people to get in touch with you? At LinkedIn. Yeah, get in touch via LinkedIn. Um, yeah, it'd be really great to speak to anybody. Please do get in touch, connect. You know, I want to take this work as far as I can. So it's just great to to have a great network and also as i say you know uh, if i can support i would love to brilliant thank you everybody thank you rosie for joining us today i'll wrap it up now um and look forward to seeing you all hopefully at a future event thank you